Hi, this is uh, Blair Suter. I'm one of the first year cardiology fellows at uh, University of Cincinnati. Uh, here with uh, Dr. Cook, who I'll let her introduce herself. And we're going to be um, reviewing a little bit about uh, LVADs or introducing them. Uh, so thank you. Well, I would have to say, Dr. Suter, that you're not very long yet to be a first year cardiology fellow. <laughs> We're recording this in June of 2021, and so it's soon to be July, and replacements are coming. Re -refresh <laughs> refreshments are coming. I'll be a second year in two weeks, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's wonderful. So, yeah, I'm Jennifer Cook. I'm one of the um, advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologists on faculty at University of Cincinnati, and we have created this series. Um, it's a primer series to give you, who's going to be joining us on CVICUB, um, a little bit of a background that might help you in managing some of our complicated patients. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Suter and welcome, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. So uh, I think LVADs are one of the most complicated topics that we deal with and probably the um, probably the most different from what you would be encountering in general medicine or general MICU. So this might be just a little bit longer than some of the other uh, primary lectures, but we're going to try to get through the material both efficiently and um, hopefully, hopefully as thoroughly as possible. So uh, the first things that I think about anytime we're using uh, a therapy in cardiology and specifically one that has such profound implications on lifestyle is how do we select patients for an LVAD? Um, going through this flow chart, uh, the patients that we end up considering are those with very advanced heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with a uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 25%. If you're a numbers person, a normal, we think about somewhere around the EF around 60%. Um, these would already be patients on optimal medication management and optimal CRT. So ones that have had uh, guideline directed medical therapy that's uh, been tailored as good as possible and are either intolerant to tailoring their guideline-directed medical therapy anymore. Um, additionally, those who are NYHA class three to four, so those are patients who have symptoms at rest or symptoms with mild activity. Um, a six-minute walk test, which is one that we do in every LVAD patient in clinic, uh, being able to go less than 300 meters. And a peak uh, VO2, so thinking back to early med school as far as oxygen uh, consumption. This is a measure that we get through a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test uh, under 14 um, mils per kilo per minute. Um, and this is more of an outpatient measure that you'd see as far as opposed to something we'd be doing in our inpatients. Um, and then additionally, patients who are having frequent hospital admissions uh, becoming more and more hypotensive, uh, creatinine trending up, and liver enzymes trending up as well. Um, Kind of this population of patients who select out have a one-year death rate as seen by the Framingham, um, Framingham evaluations and studies of 50%. So figuring out when they're eligible for part of the, for these treatments is really important. Blair, so, I'd like to ask you a question about this. And mm -hmm. one of the things, actually, it's just maybe a comment, not a question. But um, whenever you're admitting a patient to the cardiovascular intensive care unit and you recognize that they've had another admission in the last 12 months, one of the things that's really important to recognize is that an admission to the hospital for heart failure increases your risk of mortality significantly. And so someone who has one hospital admission has a risk of mortality about 18% and a second hospital admission in 12 months, it's 34%. And so already, if you're um, admitting somebody to the hospital for heart failure, their survival will be better with the LVAD than with um, medical therapy alone. Now, we don't VAD everybody who's admitted to the hospital with heart failure, but certainly we need to start thinking about it in these patients that have more than one admission. I think that's a, that's a super important point because I think some of us get frustrated too about seeing the same people in the hospital over and over again. So figuring out why they're either a good candidate for advanced therapies or not a good candidate can be really important um, for both, both the patients earlier on and then uh, uh, for their hospital stays too. Um, so those are some of the things that can make people candidates for advanced therapies. What are some of the things that make it more difficult to be eligible for advanced therapies? Uh, 
Well, I think overall, Dr. Cook, you could correct me, but there aren't any complete um, contraindications to mechanical support. There's a lot of things that we look at that either uh, when we look at the patient's complete picture can make them less of a good candidate for um, an LVAD. Those can be patients who are too old. Um, Dr. Cook, could you comment on an age that you've seen uh, for people or what we'd consider too old? Well, I don't think that there's an absolute age. In fact, one of my most successful VAD patients was somebody who was already in their 80s. So um, it's really not chronological age, but more the comorbidities and whether or not we can give them a better quality of life with the VAD. And so if you're a pretty spry 80 year old and your only prob problem is your heart is slowing you down, then let's get you back on the golf course with the LVAD. <laughs> and thinking through kind of as Dr. Cook said, as far as the other comorbidities, those can include recently diagnosed malignancy, HIV, uh, renal insufficiency and hepatic insufficiency. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. High PVR and uh, high BMI too. And I yeah. guess, oh. Yeah, I'll go ahead. So one of the things is that whenever somebody is considered for advanced therapies, we always consider them for a heart transplant first. And this list are, are things that are commonly reasons why people will not be considered for a heart transplant and will go directly to VAD. Now, just to keep in mind, about 50% of people who get a heart transplant are transplanted from a VAD. So we certainly use a lot of VADs as a bridge to transplant, but also for destination therapy. And for destination therapy are the people who are ineligible for transplant. And in in eligibility can be something that's irreversible, like age. So the age cutoff for transplant is 70. Um, but a high BMI, certainly some of these patients we've done um, bariatric surgery in after their VADs and have made them transplant candidates. Okay, thank you. So moving on from patient selection, um, I think when we, when we think about patients uh, with heart failure, we always try to classify them as these classes of NYHA 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and uh, so I think that this Intermax criteria uh, and Intermax profiles were something that was used to try to break that up into being a lot more descriptive about patients with heart failure. Um, and this is more of just something generally for you guys to know as opposed to having to memorize all this, but that we do have a kind of profiles that we can break the patients down into starting at level one, which is the crash and burn cardiogenic shock patient. Um, and then proceeding through some categories that are uh, progressive decline, stable on inotrope, recurrent heart failure, um, exercise intolerant and exertion uh, limited. And then finally, as we're breaking all these up, we get to kind of this NYHA 3B category too, which are the the more severe candidates that are minimally symptomatic with minimal exertion. Yeah, one problem that I have as an advanced heart failure cardiologist is that if you go to my clinic, all my patients have near heart association class three symptoms. <laughs> so the problem that we have in advanced heart failure is they all have class three symptoms and how do you describe them otherwise? And so that's where these Intermax profiles came from is it really breaks down the class three to class four. Um, one question I'll ask you, Blair, is have you seen um, us use a, 3A and 3B before? In I, I have not seen us using it in uh, like our clinics before, but I've heard those terminology. Yeah, it's something that, that we stump, Yeah, we like to stump um, the residents that are rotating through by using yeah, class 3A and 3B. <laughs> Um, and something that's really something that we've done in heart failure. And just to let you know what it is, class 3A is somebody who cannot climb a flight of stairs or walk a city block. And class 3B are individuals that cannot do activities of daily living due to symptoms. And so, um, and then a four, of course, are patients that, New York Heart Association class four are patients that have symptoms at rest. But, um, but that's kind of a trick that you might see or you might hear the heart failure docs talk about. So if you want to look good on rounds, I think that that would be a, a good oh, a easy, Yeah, easy music to my ears. <laughs> we got to make this worth their while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so thinking about these different types of um, either uh, a bridge to mechanical support or destination therapy, uh, as far as these different LVADs go. Uh, the first generations were in the 90s and 2000s. There was a large trial called Rematch uh, 
that showed uh, kind of improved outcomes for these patients as far as mortality would go. Um, and that was one of the landmarks. So the original pumps were pneumatic um, and that moved us into probably the, you, you won't see any of these first generation pumps on, uh, on our wards or I haven't run into any yet. I'm mm -hmm. guessing there's not any around anymore. Uh, you'll still see a few of these second generation pumps, which are the continuous flow pumps that I'll show some pictures here in the next couple of slides. The HeartMate 2 is the one that you'll see most often used on, uh, on our wards in the CVICU. Um, and then the third generation, which is uh, what most of the newer patients are getting, which is a magnetically levitated uh, pump with kind of a centrifugal flow. So you'll see some pictures and videos here in the next couple slides about those. There's something that's really hot off the presses as of June of 2021, which was the hardware pump was removed off the market. Um, it was recalled by the FDA due to um, outcomes issues. And so hardware is something that we have never implanted at University of Cincinnati, but is used in the city of Cincinnati. And so it may be that we see a hardware here and there, but they will no longer be implanted as of June of 2021. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, that original study uh, rematch from 2001 was one of the first landmark trials. So as we thought about our patient selection back from the earlier slides, the study on the left was with that first generation LVAD. And uh, that showed at the end of um, about 20 months, a 23% survival um, as opposed to uh, eight percent with medical therapy, and you can see those curves on the uh, left side of your page really pull apart uh, pretty early, um, as far as with, with medical treatment, and then they stay uh, pretty separated throughout really the one to two year period of time, um, showing a pretty significant difference between uh, medical therapy and LVAD. Uh, and then looking over at the Momentum 3, which is one of the more recent studies talking about the HeartMate 3, that is a really important study. And uh, what you'll notice there is you don't see a medical therapy arm anymore because the VADs have really become a standard of treat, uh, like a standard of care. So when you look um, as far as people with event 3, three survival versus just survival on the left side, that these are pretty impressive numbers over just 20 years. Uh, since implantation. So we were looking at, at 24 months with the first generation LVADs having maybe somewhere 20% uh, survival. Now patients with the axial flow pump, which is the uh, second generation in the centrifugal flow pump all the way up to 75% survival uh, at two years post implant is really remarkable. Blair, I'm really glad that you included this slide because a couple other things about the Momentum 3 results. One is that you notice in the first 12 months that the, the line is pretty flat, which means if patients survive the implant admission and get discharged from the hospital, they'll typically will live a year. That's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is that survival after heart transplant at one year is at 90%. And so VAD outcomes are becoming um, closer and closer to transplant outcomes as well. Great, so a couple of pictures and videos as far as how these pumps work. Uh, what you can see pictured on the left is the uh, HeartMate 2. Um, it is a type of mechanical circulatory circul support. So you'll see us use the term MCS or see that written and it is in parallel to the heart. Um, it works in a couple of different ways uh, mechanistically by unloading the LV, um, but then it also, uh, it, it pumps blood to the body, but it also imp improves coronary perfusion as well. Um, a very important thing to note about this one, as well as most of what, what we'll be talking about in this entire lecture is that none of these provide RV support. So when we're talking about sick patients later, that's an important thing to think about. Uh, a few more notes about this second generation pump. It is uh, continuous flow. It's a fully implantable device. It's designed for long-term use with a smaller size than some of the previous pumps like the first generation. It has a single moving rotor and a percutaneous drive line. So um, if you look out from this little cylinder area here, there's a, a drive line that exits the body 
Um, and uh, uh, that'll be something we won't talk about too much today, but can be an itis for infections that need to be, so that needs to be watched and then connects to the battery pack. Um, and then finally, there's an external controller. To the newer generation, the HeartMate 3, which is a centrifugal magnetically levitated pump. Um, so you can see how even the cannula looks different as it's exiting the LV apex over here by uh, number one. Although a lot of the other setup really looks the same once you get past that uh, uh, LV outflow cannula and you have the, the motor and pump, there's still a graft that's anastomosing to the aorta, there's still a drive line, there's still an external controller. This um, pump actually goes in the pericardial space and so the HeartMate 2, a pocket was created um, for the pump to sit in and this is, that is not necessary. So it's even less invasive of a surgery. Uh, one of the big points I think that you'll you'll probably get uh, called out for rounds is asking about what sounds that you're hearing for a patient with the HeartMate 2 versus HeartMate 3. And I think it's important to, to try to understand and hear the difference between them. The HeartMate 3 actually has some pulsatility, I believe once every four or five beats um, with the goal of trying to minimize stasis. So you'll hear something distinctly different as far as a, a buzz with a drop in it when you're hearing the, uh, the HeartMate 3. Gonna try this one too, but yeah, I must have. Um, we'll skip it. Yeah, you can, can see. The, yeah, you can see in the picture here uh, that blood comes down into different channels, whereas this uh, gold part is the magnetically levitated. Um, uh, essentially motor propeller that would then send blood out through the uh, aortic anastomosis. So this is, that was finishing up a little bit of background about the pumps. So what do you do when you see one of these patients? Um, I think the first question that comes, is gonna come up is, is your pump running or not? One way to do that is to auscultate over the pump which is what I was talking about as far as listening to the difference between the pulsatility versus just the continuous um, continuous noise that you hear over the pump. Uh, what, I, what I've heard before is just a continuous like most a continuous hum for the HeartMate 2, whereas the HeartMate 3 will kind of have a drop and that was to minimize stasis, like I said. Mm. where it'll, it'll drop throughout the hum that you hear. Uh, one of the biggest things is assessing vitals can be difficult in these patients too. Because there's not the standard pulsatility that we think of, it's difficult to get an oxygen saturation and a blood pressure. An A-line is definitely the most accurate that we can use for blood pressure, but uh, Dopplering a blood pressure is also an important skill to be able to do that. Uh, many of our, our uh, very talented nurses up on the CVICU are very familiar with. Blair, that reminds me of a really important point. Whenever you get a Doppler blood pressure in a patient who has an LVAD, a question that I get asked a lot is what does the Doppler blood pressure actually represent? And that really makes a big difference about whether the patient is pulsatile or non-pulsatile. Does that sound familiar to you? Have you wondered that yourself? Uh, yeah, I've wondered that myself. <laughs> yeah. So um, a lot of times, um, because the pump is a continuous flow pump and the heart is a pulsatile pump with systole and diastole, once you introduce the continuous flow pump into the system, you may have a systolic and a diastolic blood pressure, or you may not have a diastolic blood pressure at all. So the Doppler is actually measuring um, either the systolic blood pressure if the system or the combination of the pump in the patient is pulsatile or a mean arterial pressure. And so this can be very confusing for someone who's just rotating through. The type of pressure that you will probably get on a Doppler is like 75. 
And you can imagine that a systolic blood pressure of 75 is probably inadequate, but a MAP of 75 is quite significant. And so we have to put the Doppler pressure in, into context for whether we think it is a systolic pressure or a MAP. And this is something that the fellows and the attending might need to help you do once you get started, but just be aware that the Doppler could represent either one of those. Okay. Um, so I think that segues us to uh, why is that important to know what the blood pressure is and why is it important to have an idea about preload and afterload? I think you'll hear our teams talking about preload and afterload all day for all the, all the Team B patients. Uh, an increased blood pressure leads to stasis in these patients, which can lead to strokes and thrombosis, which are some of the most serious complications. And then as Dr. Cook said, a map of 75 uh, might be what you're hearing. Um, really a map of 70 to 85 is what it ends up being recommended. Um, and so that's the considerations for afterload. And preload is what you'll hear us talking about as far as patient's volume status. So it's really important uh, uh, when you're adding a, a pump into the system to have adequate preload too, because that can lead, if there's not adequate fluid moving into the pump, then that could lead to suck down events. So if patients are dehydrated or hypovolemic, then that could lead to other issues with the, uh, the LVAD. And then just generally, what are some of the major alarms that you'll hear people talking about or you'll hear and uh, need to investigate in the ICU. The hazard alarms are the ones I think about like any mechanical device or any uh, appliance that you would be thinking about as far as is the pump off, is the driveline disconnected, no external power, low flow and critical uh, low voltage. Uh, a low flow is a common more uh, one that you have to put into clinical context to try to figure out why is that pump not uh, continuing to provide the out, like the cardiac output that um, is the goal of the pump. So when I think about cardiac out output, I think of usually four to eight liters or somewhere around five liters per minute of output from the native heart. So things that can, can decrease that as far as through the pump could be decreased preload, um, obstruction of the pump, or systemic hypertension. We'll talk about uh, some of the differentials for sick patients in a few slides. So what are the vital signs of the LVAD? You'll see people interrogating these pumps and writing down different numbers that we're able to either uh, program or calculate. Uh, the speed is, uh, something that, that we typically set. The heart mate three is uh, 4.8 to 6.5 thousand uh, RPMs, which is significantly down from the heart mate two, that was eight to 10 thousand RPMs. The flow is a calculated value going through the pump based on these other values uh, that, that we've inputted or that are directly measured. Um, the flow is three to six liters, which is a little bit down from the heart mate two at four to seven liters. Pulsatility index, I think, is one of the most uh, difficult concepts to grasp as far as these different values go, and we'll talk about that in uh, good detail, I think, on the next slide. Um, but the pulsatility index is also lower with the HeartMate 3. And then finally, the power is lower, too, which is a, a direct measurement. So this is just what the display looks like, seeing those uh, different uh, um, either input, calculated, or directly measured values that we talked about, a pump flow, pump speed, pulse index, and pump power. And so someone might ask you, just based on the pump speed, do you know which pump this might be? And knowing that it's at 90, uh, 9,600 RPMs, uh, and you could easily kind of determine that, oh, this is probably a HeartMate 2, um, so one of the, the second generation. So that's set for the patient. The pump power is measured. The pump flow, like I said, was calculated. And then the pulsatility uh, index. Um, so the, which, which is uh, uh, something kind of important to consider the aortic to the LV pressure gradient. Um, so this is kind of our uh, description with uh, some more details if you think back to your Wiggers diagrams. 
as far as how to how to kind of determine this pump gradient or pulsatility index. This is actually one of my favorite slides, Blair. And one of the reasons why is that a lot of times when you round with me, you'll hear me describe this. Um, and this is really a good way to understand the PI. So is it okay if I take you through this one? Absolutely, thank you. Okay. All right, good. As I started to mention before, for every single patient who has a continuous flow pump, a certain percentage of the pump flow in the, with a certain percentage of the cardiac output for the patient is gonna be the pump versus the native heart. And so some patients will be 50-50, where half of the blood flow is coming through the native heart and the other half is coming through the pump. Others will have more blood flow through the pump in which the system will be less pulsatile and other patients will have more blood flow through the heart, which it'll be a pulsatile system. And so the first thing we have taking a look here on the left-hand side of this slide is we have two tracings on the very top. Um, the first, and I'll go ahead and have you click on it, is the aortic tracing. And the second is the left ventricular tracing. Now, this is something that our cardiology fellows are really familiar with because when we are doing left heart catheterizations, we put a catheter in each of these places. And when we do, we're able to see the simultaneous aortic and left ventricular pressures. And as we look through the cardiac cycle, one thing that we notice is that a gradient forms in diastole. So in systole, when the left ventricle contracts, we see that the aortic pressure and the left ventricular pressure are the same, but in diastole, there's decreased pressure in the LV, and that creates a gradient. And so that gradient can be graphically just shown in the middle of this slide, where the gradient is high during diastole and low during systole. And so when it comes to flow through the pump, the flow is inversely proportional to the pump gradient. So when there's the highest gradient in diastole, there's the deep, less amount of flow through the pump. And the way I like to think about this is when the left ventricle ejects, it ejects blood through the aortic valve, but also through the pump. And so the pulsatility through the pump or the amount of flow through the pump is changes throughout the cardiac cycle. But now we're gonna create a new figure on the right-hand side of the slide. And what we see here is we see a left ventricle that's not contracting anymore. And so on the left-hand side of the slide, we have an LV that's contracting. And on the right-hand side of the slide, we have an LV that's not contracting. And we know that because the systolic pressure is not even getting to the point of being equal to the aortic pressure. So this aortic valve may not be opening at all. And what we see is that there is a gradient throughout the cardiac cycle and the gradient is higher and less and changes less throughout the cardiac cycle. And the flow then is also flat. And so if you animate this one more time, Blair, we'll see that that flow, oh, go forward. <laughs> the flow is the PI. And so on the left-hand side of the slide, we have a high PI. This is a left ventricle that's healthy, that's contracting, and there's a pulsatility in the system. And on the right-hand side of the slide, we have a flat PI or a lower PI um, because the system is less pulsatile because the LV is not contracting. I think that's a fantastic slide. This is something I've had a lot of trouble explaining to, uh, to rotating residents on the, on the unit. So Dr. Cook, I, I guess I could say it this way quickly for somebody in the future I'm coming to when you think about this diastolic pressure gradient versus the entire pressure gradient. If there's a large variation in the pressure gradient, um, then there is going to be a kind of a good change in flow throughout that cardiac cycle. Whereas if there's no change in the pressure gradient, then there's going to be not much change in flow. So then the PI would be very uh, low. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the formula for pulsatility index, which we went over. And I think that, that it's kind of hard to focus on these formulas as opposed to just focusing on kind of conceptually what's changing. Um, so this is talking about the difference in the flow. So Q is the flow at maximum and minimum and then uh, over the average flow. So really how much the flow changes over that cardiac cycle. Uh, this reflects the LV pulsatility and contractility and the gener pulse generated by the EF. Um, so adequate preload would favor contractility the same way as we would think about it from the Starling curve. And that would increase PI. Inadequate preload would underfill the LV in the pump, which would lead to a lower PI. And the PI overall 
reflects a proportion of flow that is from the pump versus the left ventricle, whereas the low PI, uh, more flow and more overall uh, contribution to the cardiac output is from the pump, whereas a higher PI, there's less provided by the pump. Um, so that kind of summarizes most of the vital signs of the LVAD that we were going to review. Uh, one thing that you'll frequently see for people in the hospital and why they're in the hospital, you'll not only see initial uh, patients getting LVADs for the first time or being worked up for them, but people coming back after they've had them with different complications. Um, which even though we've shown how much better the mortality is for patients over the last uh, 20 years, uh, still high rates of many of these complications. Uh, bleeding at around 50%, there's an INR goal of 2.2 to 3, or APTT goal while we're in the hospital when the patients are heparinized of 60 to 80. And these patients are additionally on aspirin, um, 81 or 162 based on their weight. Rates of thrombosis in the pump, um, particularly from sta stasis, could be are kind of broadly listed at 5 to 40%. I'm going to uh, interrupt yeah. there for a second um, about the thrombosis. There is a high rate of thrombosis in the HeartMate 2 pumps. And so for our patients that have HeartMate 2 pumps, we still need to be very diligent about looking for thrombosis. Um, and that's one comment. Now, HeartMate 3 has a much lower risk of thrombosis. Um, and about the bleeding, what, what type of bleeding do we see most commonly? Well, you're going to be seeing admissions to the hospital for GI bleeding. And it's the non-pulsatile system with, that leads to, to dilation of capillaries and formation of AVMs, very similar to the patients that have aortic stenosis and the old Hyde syndrome, um, where our VAD patients can get GI bleeds. And so if you are a um, emerging GI fellow, <laughs> if you wanna be a GI fellow someday, you better become very familiar with these VADs because you're gonna be scoping a lot of them. And then back to driveline infections. Yeah, so the, the driveline was that kind of exit site where the uh, most the power cord you could think of it leaves the pump and uh, goes out to the battery and the controller. And something um, really important, that dressing is a sterile dressing. Mm -hmm. So you may think that the patient has a driveline infection. Don't go in there without sterile gloves. In fact, don't go in there at all. Um, we will examine the um, driveline exit site on rats or have the um, VAD coordinator who knows how to do the sterile driveline um, changes um, take that dressing down. So oftentimes I think probably the best place to really evaluate this uh, if you're uncomfortable with it um, and really having that VAD coordinator take the pictures and they put them all in the chart so that you can review and you can compare over time as well. Mm -hmm. um, RV dysfunction is one of the, uh, a very serious complication. I mean, a lot of patients that we see have um, biventricular failure and the LVAD, as we talked about, doesn't support the right ventricle as well, just the left ventricle. Um, so it can be something that progresses over time. Um, device failure is an extremely uncommon uh, problem overall, uh, just 1%. Uh, and another big area of complications is hemolysis in 10 to 20%. And labs that you'll see us follow on rounds are the LDH, which over 600 is concerning, or two and a half times the upper limit of normal. And then also the plasma-free hemoglobin is another one that uh, we typically get when patients come into the hospital to evaluate and to look for signs of hemolysis. Um, and then stroke is another one of the very serious complications. So then the question is, what do I do with a sick patient? I think this is when we always we all get the most anxious and we all get the most worried. And like, you're you're not going to be alone taking care of a crashing LVAD patient or or anything. But it's important to try to put things together to think about uh, what these patients are going to look like, and then how you can divide them up in a differential diagnosis, the same way that you put any good medicine patient or any good morning report patient. Is my patient hypovolemic, hypertensive, RV failure, pump failure, and many other categories. So I'll pull up a, an algorithm here. Um, this is a, a nice algorithm as far as LVAD patients with hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamically significant changes and really hypotension is the big one here. I'll focus on the right side at first. So the hypotension 
We talked about normal map being 70 to 85 and an A-line really being the gold standard or the, the most important way to assess blood pressure. Going to the right, patients who are having high VAD flows, think about this the same way that you would think about shock in any medicine patient. Um, are they septic? Are they hypovolemic? Are they vasodilated? So going to the right, we have if, if there's fever and leukocytosis, then that could be a concern for sepsis. Um, we already talked about them having a nidus for infection with that drive line, as well as they can be susceptible to any other infections. And also uh, they're someone who has a piece of hardware in their body too. Um, and uh, over on the right side of the page as well, if they're not having fever, um, we are, these are patients who have uh, heart failure and, you know, uh, in many patients with heart failure, we're trying to keep their blood pressure as stably low as possible. Often in patients non-VAD under 100 uh, systolic, 90 to 100 systolic, you'll see. So uh, we have patients on these vasodilating medications, these ACEs, ARBs, um, these direct vasodilators like hydralazine. Um, and then also when patients are undergoing procedures, they can go through these more vasodilatory, uh, they're using medications like propofol um, and other medications that can lead to a profound vasodilatory response. So going away from the high bad flow patients, we go to the low flows. Um, so these are kind of what we would think about to uh, patients that would have the, the more traditional like low cardiac output shock state. So breaking the patients up into a high G, uh, JVP or uh, in a low JVP. So uh, as far as for a high JVP, the echo is really what's gonna try to help guide you or tell you which way to go. If the patients have RV dysfunction, that can, that can be a helpful uh, uh, part of your assessment, although many of the patients may already have RV dysfunction. Um, the echo will also tell you about more mechanical things that you're seeing or structural things like tamponade, uh, a pulmonary embolus. I think these general medicine diagnoses uh, that can cause shock can sometimes be forgotten in these patients who are at high risk for these as well, uh, in pneumothorax. Um, and then if there is no LV, RV dysfunction, but, uh, but a high wedge on the echo, um, there may be uh, a need to kind of readjust the LVAD speed or the cannula position. Um, so I think I said a lot of this was from ECHO, but the other uh, uh, big test that we're using in continuous monitoring is the pulmonary artery catheter, the Swan-Gans catheter that you'll see that can really help you determine both the cardiac output and then also the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Uh, finally, in the uh, as far as the patients who both have low VAD flows and a low JVP, um, who would, a low JVP, you would think of those with a low preload or being volume deplete. Um, assessing the hemoglobin and the volume status are really important. Um, and as we talked about, these patients are at high risk for bleeding. Uh, doing transfusion or reversal of anticoagulation very carefully and only as really seriously needed. Um, Dr. Cook, any, any other comments on this differential diagnosis and how to break out some of the sick patients? Um, well, I would say one thing is that these slides will be made available to you as a handout, so you can have this and um, refer back to this. But I would probably say, in general, when you have an unstable LVAD patient, you make sure that LVAD is running. And then if the LVAD is running, then you forget about the LVAD and treat your patient as if you're standing in the MICU. And so heart failure is heart failure um, in a VAD patient. If the VAD is running, you treat it the same way. Um, infection, you treat the same way. Bleeding, you treat the same way. So it debunks a little bit uh, the, um, the fear factor of the LVAD patient and realize that it's just a patient who has a pump. And if the pump is running, you can just treat them like any other patient. I think that's perfect. So not every patient with an LVAD who's sick, it's not the LVAD's fault every time. Exactly. Or maybe most of the time. Exactly. Not directly. <laughs> maybe indirectly, but yes, exactly. Okay. So that is the uh, kind of end of our, our primer and our introduction to the LVAD we talked about, uh, which type of patients get LVADs,
um, a little bit of the chronology of the pneumatic and then moving on to the continuous HeartMate 2 and then the HeartMate 3, which is the centrifugal pump you'll see on wards. Uh, we talked about a little bit about what the numbers mean, specifically the pulsatility index, thinking about the gradient between the LV and the aortic valve and how that corresponds to flow through the pump. Uh, we also talked about some of the complications and then what to do with a sick patient. Uh, hopefully you guys can take a little bit from this to try to help um, to, to decrease some of the anxiety around these patients uh, in the unit and um, can uh, uh, help out uh, along the way. So thank you. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful. Um, Blair, you've done a wonderful job putting this all together and um, describing this for us. And remember, Dr. Suter, this is the end of his first year of fellowship. So it also shows how much he's learned in the first year and how much he's contributing to, um, to the field. So um, thank you so much, Blair. And I'm glad that you all have joined us today. And I look forward to seeing you in the unit. Mm -hmm.